we've all had that moment where we're watching a video and we decide, okay, I'm going to do this. I want a food forest. What does that mean? This video is going to talk about why that's a really important question to ask yourself, because with a little bit of context setting, we can tune our food forest to be perfect for exactly what we want. Let's just use a quick example. Let's say somebody wanted to build a desk. They say, I need a drill. Well, what do you need a drill for? Well, I need a hole for screws to put the desk together. Okay, so you don't need a drill. You need a hole. And you don't even need a hole. You need a desk. And you don't even need a desk. You need something to put your computer on. And where are your priorities? Is it to make and grow healthy food? Eat a bunch of salads? Is it fruit and nuts? Is it wildlife habitat? Is it climate change? Why are you doing this? Maybe you actually do want a food forest, but maybe you want something a little different. Because getting back to the topic of this video, what's your goal? Because two people who both say they want a food forest might have drastically different goals. One person might just want to grow very nutritious food to offset some of what they would buy at the supermarket and do so in a sustainable or even regenerative permaculture way. Whereas someone else who says they want a food forest might be going fully off grid, buying some land, putting a house on it, and then supplying most of their food as much as possible with a food forest garden. And one of the best things about a forest garden is that they turn your house from a liability into a revenue stream. So you can do market gardening, you can do livestock. There's a whole bunch of options where now all of a sudden your house isn't something that takes money out of your bank account, it's something that puts money into your bank account. And because of that, a forest garden has the ability to leverage yourself into freedom like nothing else. So it's really important that we get the design right from day one. It's important to understand also that what works for someone might not work for you. Everybody's got stuff they can't control, whether it's the climate, the geography, neighbors, or the government. For myself, I started a food forest because I wanted to attract nature. But depending on where you live, that may or may not come with additional constraints. Maybe inviting wildlife in is not the smartest thing if you're in bear country. And who knows where that trophic cascade leads. And if your goal is to get food for your family and you have limited space, then maybe gardening in a way that invites rabbits into your garden might not be the best idea. Maybe they multiply and take over and you get nothing. And I say I don't like fences, but if you live in Australia where everything's upside down and wants to kill you, then maybe fences are actually a pretty good idea. If you do decide though, a food forest can be life-changing. So now we'll go over a couple of examples of um, things that I would look for if I was buying a new property or setting up a new food forest, depending on what my goals were, whether I'm looking for livestock, whether I'm looking to go off grid, whether I'm looking um, to open a farmer's market or whether I'm just looking to make a wildlife sanctuary. Now what I'd like to do is go through things that if I were starting a brand new project on a brand new piece of land, things that I would look for as the top priorities when selecting the site for my future project. project. Okay, so one of the first things I would look for is contour. I would want a piece of property that has a large elevation change, um, or at least some kind of character where there's highlands, lowlands, and that sort of thing. 
Uh, the reason why I would want contour and value it very highly is that you can do a lot of interesting things with it. Swales, for example, um, ponds up high to gravity feed water to different areas of the property. Um, and I just find that contour is just kind of interesting. It's interesting and it's beautiful. And you can set up little micro areas around the farm that uh, are very, uh, they're, they're just oozing with character and each one feels differently. Now, a really important thing about elevations when you're looking at a new property is ideally the thing you wanna do, one of the first things you wanna do is gonna be put in a pond as high in your land as possible so that you have that reservoir of water to feed via gravity everything else. Now, depending on the shape of that land, your high point might be on a ridge, for example. And if your high point's on a ridge or at the top of a hill, putting a pond there, it's not really gonna fill very fast or at all because it's got no uh, water catchment area feeding into it. So if you're looking at a property and it's got some elevation changes and most specifically, if the high point of that land has hills around it that feed down into that pond, that's something worth noting because that is a very, very powerful tool that you can use in your overall site design. And just additionally, having water from other lands filter down into yours, that itself, whether it's at the, the top point, the middle point, or the lower point, that's very important as well. Because your cat, remember this whole thing is about a big black box and you're trying to maximize the energy inputs that are coming into your land. It's really important that energy from outside of your land, specifically water, is coming in towards your land and you can harvest and capture that. So if you're looking at a new property and you've got a high point with land that filters and catches water and funnels it in towards your high point of your land, take note because that is worth noting. Next really important thing to look for is an existing forest. This is a massive tool that you can use both as um, a food forest nursery, but also for raising livestock. If you can set up a silvopasture system where you have animals traveling through forest, you can get a very regenerative soil building, low maintenance and healthy way to feed your livestock. Having access to a forest also gives you access to a ton of plant material, whether it's herbaceous layer um, cuttings, whether it's food forest soil to inoculate your other soil, whether it's wood cuttings for biochar, or whether it's wood for building structures, for uh, trellises and posts, for the garden borders. Having access to an existing forest can be very valuable for setting up your food forest system. As well, forests are giant windbreaks. So having a wide open property can sometimes be difficult to handle for young trees. Forests tend to expand from the edge of a forest. So having access to a forest, you can start building your food forest property out from the edge of the existing wild forest. Additionally, having access to a forest gives you access to something valuable that a lot of people don't think of that's predators. Having access to owls and foxes and wolves and that sort of large scale predator can really um, limit how much damage stuff like rabbits and deer can do to your gardens as they get established especially. Having access to water on your land from a spring or a river is a huge benefit to your system for minimizing your irrigation needs but also for creating microclimates that you can plant around. Riparian strips um, are very, very fertile ecosystems and uh, tremendous value for the things that you can grow in and around them. And where you have water, you have life. You have animals, you have a natural security force and a balanced ecosystem. So having something like a stream on your land can be very, very valuable, not just for the actual water, but for the life diversity that it brings into your system.
Location is obviously super important as well. And it's not that being more remote is better, being inside of a city is bad, but make sure it lines up goals of your project. So if your goal is to off-grid it and have a self-resilient homestead style back to the land type of movement and change in your life, getting a little further out from the city is very good. If you're trying to raise livestock or a market garden and you need access to people to sell your goods to, being out in the middle of nowhere is not doing you a whole lot of good. For me, we're kind of a nice little balance. We're about five minutes from a decent sized town, but even that being that far out, it's very hard for me to sell anything that I produce. I have stuff at the end of my driveway, um, but, and you know, some people come by and pick that up, but being closer to an urban environment, I could sell stuff a thousand times easier. If your goal is around building community and having people over to your place, maybe uh, having workshops, maybe teaching cooking, showing gardening techniques. Being out in the country is not as good as having a tiny urban uh, backyard where you can set up a demonstration site and you can teach people how to do permaculture, um, but actually attract people to come to your property that's not miles out into the country. Another near permanent thing is government and bylaws. So make sure before you buy a property that you understand all the restrictions that are going to be on you at that property. Can you have animals? Can you have chickens? Can you even put plants that aren't ornamentals out? Do you have to kind of hide things from a homeowners association in your area? So make sure that you look into all of that because sometimes you can get this wonderful property. You wish you could do um, chickens or goats or pigs and you find out that you can't even have rabbits. It's very hard to change laws of the place that you're buying into or change community culture. Um, it's a little easier on the latter. Law is a little less uh, easy. It's a lot easier to just pick a different property that's maybe more in an area aligned with the things that you want to do on your property. Okay, another thing is check out farms around you. Check out to see if there's any sources of manure um, that you can tap into. Check out to see if there's a giant community project like a wood chip pile that you can tap into. As much as this may not determine whether or not you buy a, a property, having one really close and nearby can actually um, make things significantly easier. And it's just another thing that's worth noting when you buy your place. On a similar vein as that, um, see if the township that you're buying into has any kind of conservation authority program because sometimes they'll offer free trees and you can get high value trees like oaks and walnuts and hickory um, for free from or, or at very cheap prices from your local municipality. So that's again not something that's going to stop you from buying a property but it's definitely worth noting even if you want to raise animals. Um, being able to access and get a whole bunch of, for example, cheap willows can be a really good way to set up a quick established silver pasture system. And uh, willow, for example, is a very good fodder for a lot of animals. And if you're establishing a very large system, getting cheap willows and acorns and chestnuts and hickory nuts to feed to your pigs and goats and sheep and chickens um, can be very, very valuable. Okay, now, day has passed since the last part of this video, and uh, I do want to talk about a few more things on this. So I hope people um, don't think that this is, you know, a boring long video. It just happens that, you know, land selection is such a complicated and thorough topic. It really has a whole bunch of things that I still need to discuss, and uh, I hope, I hope, uh, being more thorough on this video is well appreciated. It'll be a longer video, but this is all really good information that you guys need to think of when you're buying new property. An obvious one that I need to talk about is climate. Now this may be super obvious, but don't live something somewhere like this if you don't like having an off season, if you don't have like having a fairly long off season. Um, sometimes we get kind of stuck into places based on where our family is or our job. I mean, that's me here. I love Canada, but if I didn't have anything holding me here, would I be in zone four? 
probably not. I'd probably be on Victoria Island, BC somewhere or in South Carolina or something like that. That being said, it gives me the opportunity to kind of do a cold, a cold climate permaculture YouTube channel for people. Um, but consider if you're starting fresh to buy new land somewhere, consider where do you want that land to be? Consider climate. Now, adding on to that, every single place on this planet has certain natural disasters that are more likely to happen in different areas. Some of them we can kind of mitigate against based on design and land selection. Um, some we just really can't. So for example, when you're buying a new property, assess stuff like tornadoes, flooding, ice storms, and fire, um, earthquakes, that sort of thing. You can't really do a whole lot about something like earthquakes, but you can do a whole lot about something like flooding. So when I was talking about elevation changes, a really important thing, especially for areas with lots of flat land, is assess where you are on flooding water flows. If you're at the bottom of a valley and you have a ton of catchment area all around you, that's good for bringing water into your land. It's also bad for bringing water into your land. So you could potentially be a flooding risk and if you're going to put in a ton of money to build a house and buy a property and plant a food forest, make sure that you know where you're prone to flooding and then hopefully you can design around it by cutting in relief pathways for areas that are prone to flooding. Similarly, if you're in an area that is a fire risk, one of the first things that you should do when you get that property is maybe to cut out a strip of forest to act as a fire barrier so that if there's wildfires all around you, um, your land doesn't get swept up into it. A lot of what we'll do will mitigate our risk to a fire, planting trees, getting shade, getting moisture in the ground. All these things really, really help mitigate against fires. But at the same time, if you have a roaring fire in the forest all around you, you're at risk. So make sure that you solve that first and make sure you consider that if you're in a fire prone area, consider that as part of your land selection. How much is the land around you putting your own land at risk of fire? And then price that in because it can be expensive to cut those strips in. That could be renting machinery, All that kind of thing. Okay, so now what I want to do is talk about, um, based on your goals for your property, what are some of the things that you should look at, based on what we talked about already, about getting up and established really quick. So one of the first things that you should do when you buy your new property. Okay, so let's start with probably what's going to be the most common thing that people do is just off-gridding, home styling, setting up a new homestead, moving out from the city, starting up permaculture journey. Let's talk about that. Okay, so first off, priorities in the land for something like that. Number one, I think, has got to be water. Water access, having some kind of river, stream, pond, something like that on your property is probably the number one thing you should be looking at. Close behind it, number two, and I would say this is also a mandatory thing, make sure that the bylaws and the government um, that you're moving into allow you to do the things that you want to do. This is kind of pass fail. If you want to raise chickens and you can't have chickens, don't start trying to petition the local government to change those laws. Just look somewhere else. Now, if you're starting your journey as an off grid or homesteader, one of the things that you're going to need to access is energy. Can you grid tie? Or are you going to go solar? As far as one of the first things you should do when you get set up, Sort out your power, sort out your water, sort out your sewage, sort out all that stuff, get a septic 
drilled and get your house built and all that sort of stuff. Once you've done that, try to come up with a site plan where you know you're gonna have house gardens, food forest gardens, maybe ponds. Try to get those ponds high up uh, in the land as you can. But then what you really wanna do is you wanna have something close to your house. Don't make a mistake of ignoring the permaculture zone philosophy. And that's not USDA agriculture zones. That's, you know, zone zero is your house. Zone one is close to your house. Zone two, you're there kind of once a week. Zone three, you're there maybe kind of once a month. Zone four, you're there once a season. And zone five, you're never there. Don't build all your food forest stuff way out in zone five. So get your, or zone four, or zone three even. Get your design set up, figure out where you're going to have a kitchen garden, a food forest strip, and as a high priority, sheet mulch that area. Even if you're not gonna plant in it for this year, get that area cardboard, compost, cardboard, compost, wood chips, and get it sitting. You wanna start that as soon as possible, building that soil, turning over from grassland to forest land so you can get trees planted. Let that kind of soak for a bit and then where you know you're going to have food for us, get that started as soon as you can. But then spend the next year or two observing your land and let that mold and modify your design. And as you're letting it mold and modify your design, try to start with earthworks. Try to start with developing ponds and swales because these are near permanent things that are going to be around for a really long time. So get those sorted out in the right place, which takes time to kind of absorb, learn your land. Um, but the sooner you can get those things in place, the healthier your overall food forest is going to be. So it's a balance. You don't want to be paralyzed with analysis. You don't want analysis paralysis, but you don't want to just jump in there and start building swales and ponds and all that kind of stuff. And you do them in the wrong area. And then now you wish you could have moved your pond somewhere else to gravity feed it or whatever and now it's a giant expensive problem that you've got to deal with. So just avoid those kind of type one errors. Okay, subset to the off-gridding is if you want to do a animal-based system, like you want to do something like Mark Shepherd with you know, cows on contour, or cows in pastures, rotate them through your land, follow them with sheep, follow them with chickens, that sort of mentality, that kind of thing then one of the first things you should be looking for obviously is open space, but at the same time access to a forest. Now, if you can get access to something like an oak forest, something that's got an edible fodder crop, willows, chestnut, hickory, that is a tremendous boon because what you should be looking at for that system is to transition your animal system into a silvopasture system. Silvopasture is basically animals walking around the forest and it has tremendous benefits for soil building and it has tremendous benefit for meat health and animal health and just ecosystem. Um, cows go from, as an example, they go from one of the worst carbon emitters on the planet in a traditional open field style grazing system and in a silvopasture system where they're grazing inside the forest, they're moved constantly um, they're actually become a carbon sequestering machine and the linchpin species uh, for health of the environment and the ecosystem. Most of the really healthy farming lands were built off of ro roaming bison. So you want to replicate that. So that might mean access to a forest. That could be a really big priority for your land selection. Um, it would mean having space for the animals at the beginning so you can get them there but then you wanna be planting trees and getting that ecosystem going so that you can run your cows, your sheep, your pigs through the forest and not through open grasslands. So consider access to a forest if you're adding animals into your system. Okay, so now let's say you're going for a market garden style property. Two most important things that I would look for if that's what I wanted to do, I wanted to move out to the country and become a farmer. I wanted to generate an income from this and the income was gonna be based on selling food. Probably the first thing I'm looking for is open land. I don't wanna just buy a forest and transition a food forest because you need to get income coming in right away. So I would want open land, good south facing exposure and you need a market. So consider where you're putting your house. You need access to people to sell your food to. So you need a market to sell to. 
Additionally, having access to water on the property um, is going to be a tremendous boon for if you're going to be growing lots of green, leafy, water-hungry style vegetables. When you're starting the property, one of your first things that you're going to get set up, obviously building the house and all that stuff that I talked about before, but getting those garden beds in the ground, getting that area sheet mulched, you're probably going to go with not a resetting sheet mulch like compost, cardboard, compost, thick wood chips. You will probably go with a sheet mulch that you can use right away in that season. Something like compost, cardboard, compost, planting into it with a cover crop. So you wanna get something that you can get up and going right away. Um, you might need to spend a little bit of money on actual soil uh, versus building your own because you really need that income stream coming in. Okay, so now let's talk about if you wanted to buy a property to do some kind of eco-tourism thing. You wanna set it up to be like a permaculture hotbed. Maybe you're gonna do workshops and teach permaculture. Maybe you're gonna let people um, you're going to build a bunch of cabins, a food forest, and let people rent like Airbnb, live on your land, graze like a you pick, that sort of thing. Probably the first thing that you want to look for in that scenario is the legal thing. Can you open your property? Can you build um, the buildings that you need to build? And is it allowed for you to have that kind of operation going? That's an obvious kind of first one. Um, but once you have that going, uh, you want to get infrastructure up and built pretty much right away because you want an income stream coming in. A really good way that you can turn around fairly quick income is if you can, if you have a whole bunch of open area on your land and you can plant some trees to kind of sell as an initial money uh, influx. So one of the consultation jobs that I'm looking at, um, the gentleman has an amazing plan and it's basically to plant Christmas trees on his land let them grow for a season and use that harvest as a quick turnaround income stream to kind of fund the rest of the project. I think that's absolutely brilliant. And you can also, while you're doing that, open your land up to camping and that kind of thing. And if you sell it as a permaculture style setup and operation, you're going to attract the right people into your land that aren't gonna drink and leave beer cans everywhere and trash your forest. So you wanna bring the right people in. All right, so that was a pretty long video. Um, I, I really do think that this is a topic where it's a great benefit to be extra thorough and have a bit of a longer video. It might Hopefully it's not too dry, but there's a lot of information in there that I wish I knew before I was starting and I would certainly want to know if I was going to go buy a new property. These are things that you absolutely should be considering. So thanks, that's it for the video. If you're not subscribed, a lot of my watchers aren't subscribed. So if you aren't subscribed yet, consider hitting subscribe if you got anything of value out of this. It does help the channel. Um, if you haven't hit the uh, notification or like video, all, all that kind of stuff helps support the channel by promoting my uh, videos to new people. So my goal on this channel is to get more gardeners out there, more people interested in this kind of stuff increase the self-resilience and self-reliance of uh, of just the population as a whole get people spending less money on food growing their own healthy food i think these are really important things that we're really lacking in the world you know food really is medicine and the, the healthier more nutritious the food that we eat the healthier that we are and we can only get there by having healthy nutritious nutrients in the soil so it's really this regenerative agriculture. I want to transition old style gardeners to regenerative soil building agriculture. I think it's super important. So by you doing these things, like liking and subscribing and all that, it helps push my video to, you know, an old style tiller gardener. Maybe they're shown a better way to do things. Additionally, if you want to support the channel, you can become a member. Uh, this is a recurring membership, anywhere from $1 to 27 bucks, and there's different uh, tiers and stages and all that. But anyone who supports will get a, uh, badges and emojis that they can use in the chat. It's kind of a fun way, um, fun way to support the channel. And if you want to support the channel but you don't want to spend any money, then a great way is to use my Amazon links for the affiliate program. It doesn't matter what you buy. If instead of typing in amazon.com and then shopping, if you just click on my link and go to Amazon that way, 
then it supports the channel. Doesn't matter if you buy the, anything gardening related, you could buy a video game or a book or you could buy a tent or whatever, it does actually support the channel. So that's a great way to support if you want to do that. Thanks for watching guys, that's enough of that. <laughs> See you on the next one. Oh, and consider sharing this with all your awesome friends. Grow our social circle. I think we've got a great group of people here. Love talking to you guys in the comments. It's, it really is, it's an amazing community. So um, make sure that you're participating in the comment section. There's always really good info down there. Bye guys.